Good morning, goeie morgen, tomelang, away, to the Catonians out there. Guys, good morning South Africa, or let me say, rather say good evening South Africa and good morning New Zealand. Yep, this is a, a, a bit of a talk regarding all the, the dangerous stuff in New Zealand. Um, a lot of people asked me in the past few weeks regarding earthquakes, volcanoes, even sharks came up and all the other nasties that we are supposed to have here in New Zealand that's scaring people off and making them decide not to come. Can everybody hear me on the other side? Let me just get a few thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, looks like everybody can hear me and um, we've had a, an earthquake here in 2010, on the 4th of September 2010. That was a big one. 7.1 struck near Christchurch, but the damage wasn't very big. Um, there was a few, few things that could have changed during that earthquake, but um, people went on with their normal lives. So 7.1 on the 4th of September 2010. About six months later, a smaller one, a 6.3, struck about 10 kilometers from Christchurch. That killed 185 people. So, yeah, there you have it. The big one was the 22nd of February 2011, 185 people killed. Most of them were killed in uh, the, the, the tower that went down. Um, let me just get the tower's name. The Canterbury Television Corporation Building. That's the one that the big one that went down. So that tower fell over and um, killed a lot of people. But because the earthquake struck at about one o'clock in the afternoon, a lot of people were outside of the normal work of business and were on the street and so on. Quite a few people actually were killed by falling rocks. Uh, bricks and masonry killed about 11 people. About eight people died um, when two buses were crushed by, by some of the falling rocks. And then about five people were killed when the, some of the cliffs on, on the, on the mountainside collapsed and that fell in. That was the last earthquake where people were killed. But New Zealand is often hit with what we would say natural disasters or so. But that, that's not because we are not liked down here at the bottom of the earth. There's a quite a good re or reasonable, let me say reasonable explanation for that. So... Let's see if we can give that reasonable explanation to you this morning and, and, and take it from there. And afterwards I'll have a, a bit of a, a time where we can have a few uh, question and answers. I hope I do have the answers for you. Alright guys and girls, here we are. I hope you love my beautiful projector here at the back. Uh, made in New Zealand. Ring of Fire they call this. This is New Zealand there at the bottom. Australia rest of the world and then you have all these plates all these plates moving around all the time forming the world and New Zealand lies smack bang into one of them let's go to the to my next beautiful slide one day Facebook will have all this stuff all right there's the next one let's see if we can get that up nice North Island South Island is this fault running through the North Island Fault and the Alpine Fault, running straight smack bang through the middle of these two islands. Then on the one side they're on the Karma Deck Trench and on the other side is the Australian Plate and then this side is a Macquarie Fault Zone. So it's more than enough reason for New Zealand to be struck by all of these different things called earthquakes and volcanoes. Give you a bit of an idea about volcanoes here. That is the volcanoes of New Zealand, from the bottom, Mount Kagel, Mount Horrible, very good name there, Akarua, some unpronounceable names, Taupu, Taranaki, Raupeu, Rotorua, the guys who know Rotorua, that's where all this, that lot of seismic activity is, I've posted a few videos on that as well, where the steam comes out of the earth and the mud is boiling, just shows you how hot it can become down there. And then all the way up to, to Auckland. Um, in Auckland itself, there's a heap of volcanoes there. And this is, this is just in Auckland. It's called 
actually the Oakland Volcano Field. Like Pupuki, one of Porto Basin, Mount Eden, the big one, Mount Albert, Three Kings, Mount Smart, Crater Hill, Mount Mangere, Wellington, Pukekawa, One Tree Hill, and Rangitoto. All of them smack bang with Auckland in the middle. So if these volcanoes go, we'll have to build a new Auckland. All right. Earthquakes. This was where the last hundred earthquakes struck New Zealand. North Island, sorry it's a bit small, North Island, South Island, that's in the ocean. As you can see a lot of, 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 of the earthquakes was in the North Islands and a lot of them all around Christchurch and then some down more at the bottom. This is only the last hundred earthquakes. This map can't go bigger than 100 earthquakes. Now, in the past 12 hours, there were 73 earthquakes in New Zealand. Most of them, nobody even felt. And they've got all these seismic detectors that pick up the earthquakes as they happen. So, this is just, I would say this is about for 14 hours. And then, here's my last chart. So please bear with me. North Island, South Island. Yeah, the big ones was in the South Island a 5.2, a 5.2. A lot of them, the bigger ones all around Christchurch. This this is only on, on a bigger scale earthquakes. Uh, there's a 6.2, there's a 5.0, there's a 4.9. Around Tarango, or off, off in this ocean there and more down here to the bottom towards Wellington and then some here regarding near Picton. As you can see some of the bigger ones also all around Christchurch. Christchurch um, is lovingly called also Shimmer City, uh, particularly because of the earthquakes that they do have there. But on average New Zealand won't fall apart tomorrow morning. Let's be quite, quite honest and open with each other regarding that. You've seen these volcanoes everywhere. You've seen there is uh, earthquakes can struck at any time so at no stage as i have i even felt an earthquake and we had 72 the last 12 hours so none of these i've even felt um some of the people here has been living here for 20 years or so say they felt one or two um especially that big one in christchurch in 2011 was quite widely felt most of these earthquakes is just about i would say under 30 kilometers below the earth crust and they are much localized type of earthquake so let's quickly talk about one or two small things as well when once a world earthquake starts in the ocean it can cause a wave and that's called a tsunami new zealand has ample tsunami warnings and on your cell phone so i can't show this to you now You've got a thing from civil defense. As soon as something like that happens, they will send an, a, a country-wide SMS or a, a area-wide SMS for where they expect this tsunami to happen. They had a test the other day um, while we were all sitting in church and suddenly everybody's cell phones just went off and beep, 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 beep. Even, through, even though you silent, uh, your cell phone wasn't silent, this still came through. Um, I see Shanta Hauser has got a question here. Does New Zealand have evacuation plans if serious natural events happen? They do have. Back to New Zealand, um, your, your fire brigade is run by volunteers. Uh, the police force is here, they're, they're permanent members. Then around the police force, there's built what they call New Zealand um, patrols. That's civilians as well. They do patrol at night. They're also basically on standby for any natural disasters or events that could happen. And then um, you have your St. John's Ambulance Service, also a lot of volunteers there, as well as permanent members on the St. John's Ambulance. And these people are, are ready to move within, I would say within a few minutes, they, they can be mobilized and, and start helping if, if the need be. The, the problem would be with a tsunami, tsunami is something quite massive, and it's just a wall of water that takes everything away in front of it. There was a smaller tsunami in, I think it's 1962 or something, I can't remember the dates now, but it's a very, very small one down here. 
could actually have been a, a large wave, if you want to call that. So I'm not going to put my neck out there and say it was a tsunami. A wave, it hit a small, of the, um, North Island, small area there, and it just flooded a, a little of the, the open space there. No damage was done, not even a house was wet or something like that. And sometimes the, the ocean can become a bit higher. But what New Zealand has done, they, they've built, especially in Tauranga, so you can quite evidently see it, they, they've built areas with they call evacuation points for tsunami. If you have a tsunami warning, you run to this point. This point was built higher. So you've got this higher point where you can go and gather together, and then naturally we have this mountain here that you can run that out to the, the people that's a bit fitter than me. Um, once you are on this tsunami eva eva evacuation point, I've nearly run out of English there this morning, Around these, these evacuation points, they've, they've built uh, canals and they've built water gathering points. So the first wave will strike and the first few houses probably will go down and then this wave will, will go into this canal system that runs the length, the full length of uh, places like Papamoa and that. Uh, and it will break the power of the water there and feed it away, that it runs sideways and not for, further anymore. So. If, if you are caught really unaware, so nobody has, has warned you about a coming tsunami, um, then probably there could be a bit of a problem. But as I said, this hasn't happened here yet. Um, what will happen if something like that happens? I, I think this country is quite geared up for something like this. They, they do have the manpower and they have the volunteers that are willing to pop out and, and put their necks out and say, let's help. But stuff like a, an a, um, earthquake that struck, earthquake, there's no predictions on that. If an earthquake has struck and they are expecting a tsunami thereafter, they will warn you before the time. That is something that, that they're very preactive on. They do not have sirens and sometimes if you are in places like Papamoa, you will hear the sirens go off. That silence is more uh, for people um, calling to the, to the fire brigade. The fire brigade has, has, has got volunteers, as I said. And they call these people, they set off the sirens so that the volunteers can come running to the fire brigade. And that is more for where there are car accidents, fire, that type of stuff where the fire brigade has to go out. Now, the fire brigades here work a bit harder than, than normal. They are very preemptive. They, they would rather go out to something before they are called out to something. So somebody phones in and said there were a car accident, the two or three fire trucks will go out and have a look. It's just a part of... Um, of, of being, how can I say, on the ball before anything really happens. So once you hear the sirens in Papamoa, though that's not tsunami sirens, that is um, it's basically just calling the fire brigade to act, action. And as Marina Pretorius really says, 19 years and never felt an earthquake. I can also say the same, but I'm only here uh, one year and a half and never felt an earthquake. And a lot of people that has been here for 20 years or so say they felt one or two, but you only feel that you've never had any real real um, damage or anything from that. Um, on that point as well, you, you've got to weigh up your, your choices regarding um, where you stay. Are you really going to be afraid for something that could never happen? Um, if, you, if you think even, let's, let's talk South Africa, if, if you stay in Cape Town, a tsunami could hit you there as well. I felt earthquakes while in Kimberley. I felt earthquakes while in, in Johannesburg. I think the guys in Johannesburg will probably feel a few uh, slight earth tremors today as well. It just it just happens. Um, but I think yeah, more and more the, the country is, is on, a, on this point where they are really, should anything really bad happen, they are, they are really geared for this and, and ready to help out there. Um, Alright, let's take a few questions. Has anybody got any questions, weird questions this morning? So, except the rand going, I see going a bit sideways towards the New Zealand dollar which is not a good thing if you still have got to bring some money over. Probably not a bad thing if you are uh, taking money to South Africa. Now, there's a, there's a few things you've got to weigh up in, in life, and one of them is you know, these earthquakes, volcanoes, and um, then tsunamis. If you are at uh, Fakatani, that's spelled with a W-H, you can see an active volcano called White Island. You can go and Google that, White Island. Um, that is just out in the sea, about 30 kilometers out in the sea. You can basically see the plume rising daily from this this volcano out there in the sea. Uh, is it going to blow? They say no. And for me, I'm not really worried. 
about that. As Shana Pina says, many earth tremors up in Gauteng. The thing is, uh, earth tremors in Gauteng is mostly set off by the, the mining industry that's not, um, it's not doing that good in South Africa. And I see a lot of the earth tremors is set up by the illegal mining, which is also a bit concerning at, at the end of the day, because, I mean, if, if something illegal is going un, on underneath your feet, then it could eventually lead to things like sinkholes and so on. Um, on the point of mining, um, to the guys and girls in the mining industry, that things are coming from New Zealand, Oceana Gold, Oceana Gold that is up in Waihi, it's about 80 kilometers from Tauranga and about 100 odd kilometers from Auckland. They started a new gold mine down there and at this current stage they're looking at all the strange jobs that you can do all around the gold mine, like uh, bookkeeping and that type of things. Alright, let's take one question. Carla de Klerk asks, why are teachers striking? Yep, um, teachers want a bit more money, point one. Then they want a bit better working conditions and they want more resources. Now, as far as I could hear about this, resources are stuff that they use in, in the classrooms and so on. So they're striking for more than just uh, their own salaries. They're, they're striking to, to better the working environment this, and they're striking to get their own working environment thus better. Um, strikes here is, is a it's a bit of a different thing. Everybody dons a, a beautiful uh, a jacket that, that's got a reflected type of jacket and they go and stand quite still and they have this little placard that they keep up and sometimes they'll do a walk and they will walk and everything is totally organized. Nobody would even drop a, 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 a sweet paper on the floor or anything like that. So. Um, don't worry about strikes here, it's not the same as what you guys are used to. And I'm not wanting to take the old country down now, but um, quite different here. Uh, Shannon Sterling asks, can anyone volunteer? Um, for the neighborhood watch patrols, anybody can volunteer there. I, I'm still a volunteer there. I, you work about four hours on a night, once or twice a month. You can make the choice how, many, how often do you want to work. Um, for the fire brigade, I've never asked about the volunteers there, and I think if you are about with the St. John's Ambulance volunteers, you probably would have to have some bit of a, a background on that. Elise asked, any demand for IT security? IT, that's in computer. Um, IT computers, there's always, there will always be a demand for IT security, if, if I'm right. Um, I can't think it will ever lessen than that. If you were talking about normal security, normal security is really, uh, it's, it's very much an old guy sitting in his, his, his bucky, as you guys call it, or we call it a youth, yeah, reading a book in front of a place. So that is security in New Zealand. Um, sometimes I was asked what does the exchange rate drop to? It was 9.6 when I looked a few minutes ago, 9.6. I actually had the exchange rate worse. I exchanged money in 2016 at 10 around to the dollar. This morning it went up. It, it actually fell down quite nicely, um, but it went up to 9 around 60 for one dollar. Uh, <laughs> Ellen said it uh, was odd to see people standing around, nothing burning. Yeah, that's that's it. That's the strikes here. The strikes here will never get get violent. Um, it's not in the nature of the people. Uh, people are actually more there to to just put their point out. And by by striking, they stop the school day. Now, when when you stop a school day, the teachers aren't getting paid. Let's be about that. Uh, the, these teachers has, has gone on strike for their own salaries, for better working conditions, for better resources, and they they aren't allowed to get paid today. Even the teachers who's not on strike has taken the day off. So that's a, an unpaid day. And I think it's the third one this this year, if I'm right. Or there's going to be three, something like that. Um, but on the end of the day, they have got a, a valid point. Um, some South African teachers have tried to get residents now, but their salary was too low. And the, the minimum, I think, at this current state is about 55 or 52. And this teacher was paid 48. Um, but it's all due to where she was working and so on. I know a bit more about that story. Um, yeah, any other questions that anybody feels we need, we need to answer this morning while we are on this positive note about volcanoes and strikes and nothing burning? Teacher salaries in New Zealand is not bad at all. Like, 
if, if you think a, a good teacher can, can earn up to $100,000, it all depends on, on how many years experience they have, um, in which school they work, are they primary school or higher education, that, that's all where at the end of the day the, the, the fee um, has come down to and, and, and the final price just depends on, on where they are working and so on. Guys, let me tell you something else this morning. Um, I, I last week talked about Wellington. I got a bit of flack there because I said Wellington's always wet and windy. I'm glad to see some people have posted some pictures of, of Wellington on a good day. Um, but let's talk about Taranga and the weather here. So Taranga, this morning, if I look out from my windows, it's still extremely dark outside. It's just past 6, 20 past 6 in, in New Zealand. Taranga has had a bit of rain now. We, we need... We need some more rain, actually. Um, we, we, we get a lot of rain during the winter. It's very much like Cape Town. Oh, Cape Town. Uh, winter rains. Um, rain here hasn't been that much. We've, we've had about 8 moles yesterday, which is not a lot. And then we had about 20 moles two days ago. So, weather here, still about hot. We, we had a few cold nights now, going down to about 10 to 12. And then uh, during the days it goes up to about 20. So it's very, very, very milder type of climate. I know down in the South Island it's cooler than here. So the the the, the average in in Tauranga will be about I would say between a very cold morning would be about eight, and a good day in winter will be about 20. So keep that in mind if you're heading this way. Let's see. There's one or two questions coming up here. I heard the jobs are much constant, much contracting as opposed to permanent no there's there's a lot of permanent jobs out there as well when you enter the job market the first three months basically is on, the, on a contracting type of basis or the basis that they, they, they give you a chance they can fire you within the three first three months easily but thereafter most of the people is on a permanent basis do kids have earthquake evacuation drills at school i don't know but i can't see why not um, i would believe that this will be something that that they are very reactive on um, any advice on good second-hand vehicle companies? To be quite frank on, on good second-hand vehicle companies, you've got to watch out and got to look at what you are buying. Um, there's, there's a lot of, lot of what they call Japan imports here, and they come from Japan, um, quite good quality cars. you just got to not be worried about the, the age of the vehicle, um, 2005, 2006, 2007 year models. Great cars, low kilometers, some of them has got very high kilometers, also watch out for that. Um, not, not a lot of um, bad cars down here, they, they, they've got this thing that's called WAF, Warranty of Fitness, that the cars must go through. So if you've, if you've got a car, if you want to buy a car, ask for the Warranty of Fitness and see how long it's still valid for. If a car doesn't have a Warranty of Fitness, you've got to think about why not. Um, I would really step back from buying any car that's not, that hasn't got a warranty of fitness. Uh, warranty of fitness is you take your car into a, either a, a qualified um, garage or replacement center or the AA and they check your car all over. They check the tires, they check for anything else. So anything wrong with that car will be marked and you won't get a warranty of fitness until that has been um, that has been repaired and warranty of fitness costs in the region of about between 50 and 55 dollars so if you think somebody's not willing to go to the length of paying 55 dollars for warranty of fitness then probably something big uh, wrong with that car can you change your visa type job if you are not happy where you are if you want to find a new job perhaps that comes from Shana Shana I have heard about other people that have moved between jobs um, it has happened and I think immigration gives you something like three months, but don't quote me on that. I think they give you something like three months uh, time to change around from the one position to the other position. But this is also something that you should not be doing on, on a regular basis. Um, employers employ South Africans and then suddenly within two months or a month, they jump from one employer to the next employer and that employer will probably never employ a South African again. So stick it out there um, because if you stick it out, and after your period that you that you must be employed with him, you move on to somebody else. They have got no reason to say that South Africans are just jumping through them to get into the country. About the water, is the water from trap drinkable? This is tap water. Um, we do buy bottled water here. Yeah? 
you do buy bottled water here and then that's bottles of water just goes in, my, in the back of my car so wherever I stop I just grab a bottle of water from the car um, especially if we go for a bit of walks but yeah water from the tap is very drinkable um, even water from some of the streams I will easily drink just like that out of the source so uh, water being quite a quite a big big thing here um, they have this this big thing about water being in, exported now to China from here. They they bottle that or they send it by massive containers through to China and then bottle it there and sell it off. And there's a bit of a wow wow about that, and people's not that very much happy about that happening. So, what else can I help you with? I see there's a few minutes left. Um, the set is changing your your visa type. Uh, I think if it, the visa type or the job, I think most probably you'll have to go for the same type of job as what your visa are. If you want to do a visa ch ex uh, change, it will probably be a whole um, whole new application on that. So keep that in mind. Um, some people have come in on their wife's visas. Then the husband get a, a job because he's an open visa. Then they've changed all around and he went and became the main applicant and the wife could then step back from her day to day job. It was just something else I heard about the other day and it worked for them. Um, can't see why it can't work for other people as well. Both of them are still employed by the same company. Just keep in mind, um, you get what, can get what they call a section 49 on your, on your uh, visas and, and that's regulations that, that bind you to an employer. Um, I had a, a section 49 on my residence and that was for me to work for 12 months at the specific employer where I was employed. Did you see the last question here? Yeah, we are going to get a, a, a guest on for to talk to you about younger families and so on. I'm just looking for that specific guest. Um, the problem is um, I don't have one yet. So if there's anybody out there who's willing to want to come and talk about families, schools, that type of things, um, yeah, feel free to to send me a message. I will want you on this on on our Facebook Live program, and um, I think it's quite quite a good um, topic to have. Which bank is the best to open an account with, guys? If if you're out of South Africa, you can open an account with any basically any bank. Um, big ones is Westpac, ANZ, BNZ. Uh, and it's Kiwi Bank as well, TSB. You can do a direct application on the internet under the migrant banking category. I've got mine with um, with Westpac, and on on the, on the Westpac side, <clears throat> that's quite easy. You, you you do open your things, and then uh, once you arrive in New Zealand, you just have to be with. Um, into the nearest branch, you come with your, your, your passport and you show your visa and they will help you from there on. I had a card immediately issued to me and then the, the newer card sent to me via post about, I think, three days, four days later. So, yeah, that was just, just my experience with Westpac. I never had really had any problems with them. Let's quickly see, how do people arrange interviews via the website first and then fly over to go do the interviews and hopefully get a job? Or do people fly over there and go look for the job? That's from Marnas. Marnas, both of them, both of these statements are correct. Um, some people line up interviews, then fly over, and in a week or two weeks' time, attend to all of these interviews if they can. Other people fly here, um, but with a good idea of where to go for interviews, and then they, they go to that comp uh, company straight out. But I also see a new trend or don't know if it's a new trend but I see this trend under South Africans flying over coming to sit here for weeks um, and then trying to apply f while they are here to interviews and I see that's not su so successful um, the, the big thing there is they, they don't have real time left they, they don't have time left to, to, to do these interviews once they come up um, I think coming from South Africa spending all that money just to come here with your visa and only have three months on your first visa, I think you should you should become much more prepared than what most people are coming over to. Um, get get a list of your, your qualified employers and take it from there onwards. People that are successful is people that have really made massive effort before that and, and have, have applied to quite a few places and 
are ready, CV ready, document ready, has got everything in place for them. And that will give the, the, the employer confidence that they can employ this person who will not take ages to reach her. Um, when Werner and Vanessa ask about the changes coming to the new migration laws into effect in August, I don't know what changes they are going to do. I think we'll have to wait until um, August to see that. IRD number or bank account verification once there. IRD wants to know your bank account number. So I think bank account number will be the first thing. Do your migrant banking thing. And once you are here, you do your IRD number. It's also online. It's a very online process. It takes about two to three weeks. If you are if you are in need of a, of a, of a quicker turnaround um, time for your IRD number, then you can phone them and say, guys, this is urgent. And within about three or four days, you'll have your IRD number. But it's just a process of about taking three to four weeks and so on. Sean Long asks, when you mention qualified employers, what do you mean? Sean, Google qualified employers in New Zealand, there's a full list of, of companies. These are companies that have already got, um, I would say, the go-ahead from Immigration New Zealand to employ foreigners. You need, it's, a hec it's quite a hectic process to go through. You need to have certain criteria and why you would employ a person that's not a New Zealander. And as part of these uh, criteria is that they do need to advertise um, quite widely. Now, if, if you are a qualifying employer, I think you do not need to, to advertise that position in New Zealand, or I think that is part of, of, the, of the criteria today, but they are, are really, not a lot of questions is asked from Immigration New Zealand towards these qualified employers. And um, once once you apply to them, it's it's actually a quicker process than going through somebody who's who's not a qualified employer. Yeah, it, it's quite a, a much longer process because Immigration New Zealand will phone them and find out have they have they tried getting a local? What is the chances of getting a local? What's the chances of training a local? So a lot of extra questions that the employer have to answer. So it's actually much much longer process just on that. Uh, Elise Comfort. Asking is property ownership expensive. Um, at least in Taranga, this is about the fifth largest city in New Zealand. You won't buy um, a house really for under six hundred, six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now that in South Africa is rand is about six and a half million rand. Okay, if you go to Plattetloof in Cape Town, one of the most, or one of the the elite suburbs in South Africa, you can buy about a ten bedroom house for. So have 10 bedroom house, three stories, about three or four um, sitting rooms and about 10 bathrooms. You'll pay about 10 million rand for that. A 10 million rand, bring it back to New Zealand, is about $1 million. You will buy not a lot of house for $1 million in, let's say, areas like Auckland. Even in Tauranga, you'll get houses for $1 million easily. On average, a house in Tauranga will cost you... Uh, from 650, but the more average houses that you would like would be about 800, 850,000. That's eight and a half million rand. So it's a bit more expensive, but the interest rate here is now at 3.89%, so it's a bit more affordable. Um, you can actually repay the, that type of house. Let's say if, 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 if you are stingy and buy a house for $650,000, you can repay that. Um, and remember, you got it, you need to deposit the site. Plus, if you come on a work um, visa, you would need special permission before you are allowed to buy a house. All right, guys and girls, let me see if there's anything else. How do we transfer money from New Zealand to South Africa? Guys, if you want to bring money from New Zealand to South Africa and you do not want to do it through the banks, because the banks are a bit more expensive normally, you can send me an email. My email address is admin at yanfilyun.com, admin at yanfilyun.com. I'm a financial advisor in New Zealand and I help uh, South Africans, especially with uh, bringing money over from South Africa to New Zealand. Um, I also help them with their wills, I help them with their life covers, disability, income protectors, the same stuff that you had in South Africa. So that's me. We went a bit over the time this morning. Sorry about that to the people who want to go watch Seven Alarm. Um, you can watch Seven Alarm in, in New Zealand. My wife does it every every it's every morning early. She watches Seven Alarm on um, on YouTube, so, but that's us. Guys, if, if you need anything more, send me an email, send me a PM, as everybody else does. Thanks a lot for listening to me this morning, and don't be afraid of volcanoes, earthquakes, or tsunamis. They are not that common here. Okay, have a lovely evening, stay safe, love you and leave you. Goodbye.